again. And so without much ado, I want to welcome Camilla Nontra. Yay! <laughs> oh my goodness, I should I should come to you every day when I'm feeling <laughs> what I need. <laughs> Correct. This is super. Right. Wow. Sudan. Believe it or not, Sudan has more pyramids than Egypt. Interesting. Mm. Begin to think in a pan African way because they, they now see that their conditions are not just about that local space, but the condition is linked to all of the. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well this morning. <laughs> there we have our t shirts on Pan Africana. <laughs> Welcome to the Pan Africana show. We have another pack show today. We have a special guest today. We want to start by thanking God for the morning for today. By Him we live, we move, and have our being. And I'm going to hand it over to my co-host, Jesse. Jesse, take it away. So welcome, everybody, to another episode. As always, I, I am Jesse McCoy. I am honored and delighted once again to be with my co-host, Fred Nantra. And we have a very, very, very special guest today. So let me let me read off this title, okay? I want to make sure that y'all get all of this, right? So we we are up here calling her Juanita, but I want y'all to get it right. This is Dr. Juanita right. Lewis, yeah, agriculture right. and gender policy consultant slash food scientist. Get it right, okay? And we're gonna talk about all of this. We're gonna talk about why we, how black people get into food science. We're gonna talk about okay, some of the, the travel she's got going on. We're getting all into it. But first, before we start, I want to say hello again. It is good to see you, my friend. Right, it's been a minute. It's been a, it's been a long time. <laughs> been a long time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like last time, I think it was a graduation. Yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> yeah, it's a gradually. Yeah, graduation. absolutely. So uh, I want to. Oh yeah, well you know we we all we all, <laughs> we're changing it up a little bit. Yeah. Well, before we get into all of your, your accolades and everything that you've done, I want to start off, you know, this is going to be kind of like Barbara Walters. I want to start off first by giving people a little bit of background. There are people who are going to chime in as we go through because they're going to want to know about your story and how you transitioned from America to Ghana. But first, where are you from? And tell us a little bit about your hometown. Sure. Um, so I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I was raised between both both places. I lived in Camden as well as and my parents settled in Glassboro, New Jersey. Went to school in Philly. So through and through, it's so funny. My friends who are like, oh, you're from, I say, I'm, oh, I'm from Jersey. My friends are like, no, you're a Philly girl through and through. Um, and I lived there, of course, till I was 17 and then moved moved to North Carolina um, for college, and that's how I graduated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so my hometown, I mean, I grew up, so, you know, the first couple years of my life, I lived in Camden, so, you know, you see people that look like you. Um, um, and, but I went to school in Philly, and my elementary school was predominant, was actually all Mrs. Krause in like first grade. Um, it's, you know, we lived on the white side of town. We were the first black people in our development at the time, and our neighbors next door were Jewish. Um, our other neighbors who were maybe about, about a plot and some change away, they were also white, but our Jewish neighbors, we were their kids. My sister and I, we were their children. We didn't even think of anything different um, until they had kids. And they were so used to being around girls. They actually ended up pumping out three boys. They were so irritated because they were used to having um, girls all the time. And they used to tell people like, oh, we're their stepchildren. So um, I was kind of, you know, it was my first exposure being around other cultures that didn't look like me, even though my parents have a very diverse group of friends. Friends, uh, um, I grew up in a dual religious household. My mother's Christian, my dad's a Buddhist, which is a whole other story people always want to hear about. So, I, you know, I knew a lot about Eastern. Yeah, I always knew about Eastern philosophy as, as well as Jesus, uh, <laughs> and um, really didn't even 
recognize my that I was quote unquote different as far as color until I went to school in, in New Jersey, um, where I was the only, you know, black girl in the class or the only black girl on the soccer team, which always makes me a fan favorite being here in Ghana because I know about football. Um, and played soccer for years. The real so football. Was, yeah. yeah, real football. Yeah. <laughs> Left his head injuries, kinda sorta. But um, you know, I <laughs> But it was very different. So, and my hometown is a college town. Um, it's Rowan University. If you know anything about the tri-state area, so you see a lot of college students. Um, but all the other, you know, people of color, they lived on the other side of town, and I really didn't have much of an interaction as far as having friends until really I got to high school. Um, you know, so it was interesting being on the side of town that we grew up in. It was very, not isolated, but it was just different, different social economic class because we were, you know, everybody's middle class, but you could feel the difference. So, Juanita, I, I spent about 13 years in Philly. What part of Philly are you talking about? Sure. So, my <laughs> parents are from Northwest, so we always say Northwest. My mom's from Germantown, my dad's from Mount Airy. I went to school in West Philly. Um, on 52nd and Spruce. So I went to Andrew Hamilton. And then all my aunties, oh, wow. except for my mom, they're all girls high girls. My mom taught at girls high. Um, and she retired from the girls high a couple years ago. You know, my grandparents um, live off of Broad. They live off of, uh, was it? they live in West Oak Lane. So they're right around the corner from Temple. And my oh, wow. dad's mom is in still in Mount Airy. Mm -hmm. So I mean, my dentist is in, was in Philly growing up. My cousins were still there. You know, I still have family. You know, some of my cousins have moved back um, to the city. So, you know, getting around town and knowing where to go to eat the best cheese stick. Most, I'm sure, Fred, you know, everybody says, oh, they can go to Pat's and Gino. No, we don't. We don't. No, mm -hmm. no, that's, I, I don't like it either. <laughs> and, and actually, the place that we uh, would eat. At the time growing up, I think that place was closed down. I think my mom said she went there like several years ago and the place was getting robbed. And she was like, I just want my cheese steak. Like, <laughs> can, can I just take the my <laughs> So it's always interesting. So going home, you know, I mean, my dentist is off of Chestnut Street. So, you know, very much know the city. Um, and then, you know, every when I go home, I mean, I'm, I'm in Jersey, but most of the time when we go into the city, like we're there and it's just like we see everybody. Oh, wow. absolutely. Shout and out I to Philly. Gone. And I think <laughs> on all day, every day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't say, I don't say uh, sprinkles. I say Jimmy's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So that was the best, that, that was the best joint, joint in town, right? Right, that's that's John's town. Right, right over there, right over there, right over there, up the street. <laughs> Philly people, stand yeah. up. Well, let, let me ask you this, because you've had an experience um, growing up in Philly, and then you spent the bulk of your higher ed time in the state of North Carolina. What would you say was the biggest difference or biggest change in being in North Carolina versus being in Philly? Everything closes down at like nine o'clock and the sidewalks roll up and <laughs> that was so different. Um, also, um, not having to, you know, pumping our own gas is illegal in Jersey. So that's the one thing I did. You know, I yeah. didn't like being in North Carolina. I'm like, it's hot. I got to pump my own gas. What do you mean? Um, and also much slower. Um, and then also understanding the vernacular that's being used in North Carolina. I would say being a, living in North Carolina for what, 12, 13 years, I was actually able to better understand my grandmother who's from South Carolina. So that was very interesting because she has her own way of saying things and a lot of the cultures are somewhat similar. Um, so I was able to kind of pick up and really kind of translate what she was saying my first time coming back from North Carolina. Um, but it was uh, it was different. It was definitely different, um, you know, coming from the North and also just how people say things in the North were very, very, of course, you know, direct. Some of us call us cutthroat. Um, how I was <laughs> in college is very different than how I was in, you know, in, in grad school. I would say, Jesse, you probably caught me right at the beginning of my transition to being a little bit nicer because 
you know, we met what my we our first year of, of, of we were in law school, it's first year of my master's, and I was still very mm-hmm. much like, ah, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> so <laughs> as, I, <laughs> as I stayed in North Carolina a little bit longer, I was like, Oh, oh bless your heart. Oh, it's okay. You know, and they don't say that in North. <laughs> so that was very, really different. Very yeah, but bless your heart in North Carolina means you just got cursed out. <laughs> which, which where I grew up, where, how I grew up is always oh, okay, and that's what we used to. Oh, okay, that means you're not gonna make. <laughs> right. I got I got something for you. That's just what, what I grew up here. Oh, I got something for you. Be like, oh, you're tired about the flash. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. We we say bless your heart while we slashing the tires. That's, that's a, bless your. <laughs> that's, that's aggressive. <laughs> so I, I want to kind of get into what you do for a living. Um, first off, I just got to thank you. Black excellence is all through this podcast. So so yeah. thank you for that. But uh, what prompted your interest in food science? Oh, so it's actually kind of funny. I wanted to be um, a pediatric neurosurgeon. I actually idolized Ben Carson. Wow. Wow. Uh, (laughs) Still? Still? (laughs) Gifted hands. Don't want none of those hands. So I I idolized uh, Ben Carson at the time. And I have a cousin who, um, shout out to Kama, um, who lives in D.C. now. And he was a surgeon. So we would talk about him being in med school because at the time, I think I was in high school, he was just finished. He just started his residency or something. So I was like, all right, this is what I want to do. So he was telling me his path. You know, oh, I was was thinking I'll major in psychology. I wanted to go to Spelman, like I think every black girl in America just about. And, and, you know, went to St. Aug. I was like, I'm going to North Carolina. It's it's slow in North Carolina. (laughs) And (laughs) one of the best decisions I made, my mom always said, if you give it a year, if you don't like it, you come back. Then I thought about where I would go. I'm like, I don't want to go to Temple. You know, I don't want to do any of that. So I stayed and I was going to major in psychology. Um, my, I played in the band, um, actually played in the orchestra. So my family, my mother's side, they're musicians. They all play an instrument. I have a cousin who's a jazz pianist. Da, 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 da. And I played the French horn, classically trained, and then played the string bass as well. So when I went to St. Aug, I was on a music scholarship. And I also sang, sang at one point in life as well. Um, and so when I went to North Carolina, I decided my band director told me, oh, well, if you're thinking about going to medical school, why don't you major in chemistry? What? <laughs> so I said, chemistry? Okay, I like chemistry. Um, they had a chemistry, they just got a big, um, um, they had a big uh, scholarship money or something, funding they received from a National Science Foundation. So as a result of that, I was majoring in chemistry. I played in the band, which is probably my first um, experience of what it's like to be part of an organization. I ended up becoming a Delta later, but those pre-band days got me together because um, we had to be at band by 4.55. <laughs> and, you know, I was in the lab all the time for chemistry. And then as a result of doing that, you know, we had this opportunity to do an internship. And I decided I didn't want to go home for the summer like, you know, some freshmen, I wanted to stay in North Carolina. I made a lot of friends throughout the year, my freshman year, and I was going to do research. And we were placed in, just randomly placed in different labs at NC State or, you know, throughout NC State because of the result of this funding. And I had a op- opportunity to intern with Dr. Leon Boyd at North Carolina State University, which was 15 minutes away from St. Aug, in the food science department. Now, I love food. I did not cook growing up. Um, my parents are still amazed to this day that I cook and bake as much as I do because they really thought I probably burned water. That's probably how bad it <laughs> um, And <laughs> So now they're like, what? You cook all the time? Who is this child? Um, my sister, on the other hand, is like totally different. And so I had my first exposure in food science in 2002. And I liked it. I thought, okay, this is cool. I worked on muscadine grapes, which is a big thing in North Carolina. Looked at um, the compounds in grapes to see how they have health benefits within the skin. And I kind of dibbled and dabbled back and forth about becoming a food scientist until I got to my master's where I had the opportunity to 
leave the group I was in to fulfill, you know, whatever research I wanted to do. And I said, you know what, maybe I'll go ahead and actually do what I want to do, which is get into food science. So I called Dr. Boy. He has been my mentor since I was 18. And he was like, yeah, go ahead. And, you know, I have space in my lab. I finished out my master's doing his work and then decided to pursue my PhD in food science. So I, he was the first black person PhD in peanuts. And, and so I was just so fascinated, like, you know, understanding how food comes together, the compounds, why we feel certain things when we chew food, why we smell things. And, you know, if you ask my family, they said, it's not a surprise because I smell all of my food before I eat it. That determines whether it's attractive to me. Um, and then <laughs> what? I end up what? Thinking, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always, I always smell my food. And I'm like, I don't want this. Um, hmm. And my grandfather does, apparently. But I think, yeah, Jesse, when you met me, I think I just started, like, cooking at the time. Um, so, you know, definitely, you know, how Jesse and I met, his cousin was my roommate. So, you know, we definitely benefited in those in those master shares because I was <laughs> trying different things. So, finally kind of caught up with me later on as far as cooking. Interesting. Interesting. So, now I want to make this big transition. This is what people have been tuning in for, right? <laughs> you are joining us today from a country that Fred knows very well, right? This country. Yep. What? Where are you calling us so from here? here? <laughs> I am calling. I am in Accra, Ghana. Accra. Yeah, Accra. Shout out Accra. So, <laughs> what on earth took you from First of North all, Carolina? Just, Jesse, before oh, I, she goes on, I want to say Aquaba. Yeah. Ah, uh, uh, <laughs> so I don't know welcome. what's happening. <laughs> welcome. welcome, and she says thank you very much. So, ah, okay. ah. Well, I, I want to know how, how does one from Philadelphia who got the bulk of their education in North Carolina decided that they were going to do food science? How does this? Now, Dr. Food Scientists end up in Accra, Ghana. What, what happened? Um, as they say here in, in Ghana, Fred, you know, Chale, let me tell you the story. Chale. So, <laughs> Chale. <laughs> Chale. Um, so, you know, of course, going to school with other uh, national, you know, other diverse groups of people in high school, I wanted to go to an HBCU, which is why I got St. August HBCU for people who don't know. And then Jesse and I met at North Carolina Central, and then I went to North Carolina State, which is a predominantly white institution. So I always knew I wanted to work and live abroad, but just not necessarily where. And I think most Americans, we think of Europe. Um, I don't know too many people who say Australia. And we'll when we think about Africa, we think about South Africa, and I've been to South Africa, which is basically California, but they drive on the other side of the road. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's basically what it is. And so um, Ghana is not something I was not exposed to. Uh, one of my cousins, her husband's Ghanaian, so they would go all the time, you know, um, back and forth a lot. He has a house, which is actually down the street from where I live in West Lagon. And oh. I, uh, yeah, I know, small world. And I swore I was not going to live in West Lagon, and I live like 10 minutes from this man's house. So it's hilarious. <laughs> but um, I, um, I thought I wanted to live in Europe, but I knew I wanted to be like in a very diverse, you know, city, like a Paris, um, which I only live in certain wards, you know, where all the Africans are. And, you know, I wanted to be in those spaces. And I started traveling internationally when I was in high school. And so when I got to, when I finished up my PhD, I lived in Minnesota. I lived in Minneapolis for three and a half years, worked at General Mills. And then I got a policy fellowship because I realized over time that I actually wanted to do policy, not do, not do research at all. Um, and so I did a policy fellowship, um, the German Marshall Fund. It was the Marshall Memorial Fellowship, and I got to be in Europe for a month. So I was in Europe for a month, living my best life. Went to Portugal, actually was, you know, got a chance to see where we live, you know, where other black and brown people live in these countries, you know, and as my dad always says, you know, oh, we're everywhere. You need to find a railroad track. You know, we might live on the other side of the Himalayas, other side of the avalanche, you know, we're around there somewhere. And it was true because I went to Denmark, which is basically, you know, big brother Minnesota in a way. Um, and you see different people. 
different people of color. And Lisbon, I mean, you know, obviously Portugal is the one that they're the, the country that kicked off the slave trade. Obviously, mm-hmm. you start to see black and brown people there. And so I wanted to do policy and work in the government. So I did the AAAS fellowship and transitioned over to D.C., um, I hightailed it out of Minnesota, but I learned a lot about Minnesota because the culture there is very much, this, it's very similar to Ghana um, in a way, very kind of passive aggressive. You see that, I saw, I was like, wow, it feels like I'm living in Minnesota, but it's, everybody looks like each other. So it's very different. It's not a bad thing. It's just different because the East Coast is very different from the West Coast, very different from the South. So you're learning these different cultures because I think a lot of Americans, they come to Ghana, they'll feel like, oh, you know, someone's here to embrace me and they will hit you with a bless your heart. You'll be like, wait, what? That's, I know what that means. <laughs> very like, yeah, it's the same thing. Um, so you learn very quickly. Um, so I worked at the State Department for almost four years and my fellowship which is the first two years I worked in the Office of Agricultural Policy. So I covered women in ag. And I said to my boss at the time, okay, I'm a food scientist. We work on biotech. We work with embassies around the world. But I never hear us talk about including women in the space. And what can we do? So I developed, I created a, we never had a gender strategy in our entire Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. So I have rolled out this ag gender policy strategy included programming, how much it costs. And I was, you know, and I was going to have it, um, <coughs> excuse me, go to South Central Asia because that's what I covered at the time. And then no one wanted to me to go to India, which was fine. Um, and so my boss said, why don't you take it to Africa? And I was like, all of Africa? And she's like, well, you know, talk to the embassies. So I sent out this call for interest and I had a hit from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Accra, Ghana, and Pretoria. Oh, and then I had to pitch it to Pretoria, South Africa. I have a friend there who lives in South Africa. He's Ghanaian and African-American from Philly as well. And he brought me to (laughs) South Africa. And so how amazing how all these things come together. So I launched this policy, Women in Ag policy dialogue series in Ethiopia in 2017. (laughs) October, actually around this time. And we connected 100 women working with the Award Foundation, which is African Women in Ag Research and Development, amazing organization um, that was put, that's been organized and ran by this a Kenyan woman, I think she's Kenyan, um, and in, yeah, I think it's in Kenya, yeah. So they're based in Kenya and they have these chapters of, of women <coughs> scientists who are in grad school all over the continent. So they would, she was like, anytime you got a dialogue series, we're sending our girls. And that, and they would come. So we had, um, we talked about biotechnology from the regional um, aspect. It was never from a, hey, we're the Americans. We're coming to tell you what you did wrong. No, I don't want to see any white people, you know, unless they can't find, unless they, God forbid, can't find anybody. Um, but this is for women, it's for women of color by women of color. And um, I went to Ethiopia for a week and a half, came back for a week, went to Ghana for a week and a half, launched one there where we talked about biotech and, it's, and how it's discussed in the media. And then in South Africa, we talked um, about how women were needed to come together as far as being able to organize and how they can work with private sector. And so because of the, the um, dialogue I did in, in Ghana, one, this one guy, his name is Isaiah, he said, hey, have you thought about living in Ghana for, would you, would you be okay with living in Ghana for three months? I'm like, sure, I'm single. Like, I don't have nothing to do. That's fine. <laughs> so he was like, sure. And so this lady approached me later on and she's like, hi, my name is Karen. You know, we would love to have you come back and live here for three or four months. Heck, you can even make it six months. And I said, I don't know if I could do six, but I could maybe do three because I have rent to pay in D.C. And so I came, I applied for an embassy science policy fellowship through the State Department and lived in Ghana in the summer of 2018. I got a chance to go to Togo. Um, I went to South Africa to launch that one. I was supposed to go to Dakar, but couldn't go. And, I, and then we had to end up canceling the one in Liberia. But the effect. Uh, you know, I, and I worked on connecting women in agribusiness and women entrepreneurs. I mapped out the women who were in Accra and uh, created this strategy for the regional environmental office of how to connect women in STEM. And then I also launched um, Young Gifted in Brown. 
And so, uh, you know, a play on Young, Gifted, and Black, and that was connecting young Ghanaian women to women of color STEM entrepreneurs who were in Ghana. And we launched that through the embassy in 2018. And I had a great, great summer. I lived as a diplomat, you know, so it was a different lifestyle. I had diplomat passports. You couldn't tell me nothing about my black passport. Now I'm regular. And so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> now they're like, Madame, where do you think you're going? I'm like, ah, darn. So, you know, it's, it's, it was different, but I enjoyed it. And from living here for three months, I said, you know what? I, I want to live overseas and I want to move back to Ghana. Uh, if they had offered me a job when I was here the first time, I, Jesse, you probably, well, no, you had already seen me already, so it would have been fine. But, you know, you wouldn't have seen me. <laughs> you know, you would have, I would have left in 2018 instead of in 2020. Understood. That is a, a phenomenal story. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know which part to be more impressed with. It's a State Department in a Trump administration. <laughs> uh, uh, very shocking. I see you shocked right. as I am. <laughs> and you know, and it was interesting because at first they were trying to claim my work under Trump, and I was like, "Hold on, no, this, this concept note was written under the Obama administration." I hate to tell you, and it was implemented during the Trump administration. And I would definitely say what was surprising is that the person who was our assistant secretary, I mean, she's the political appointee, mm -hmm. but she very much is about women's empowerment. So okay. because of the work that I, I did at the time, any women's empowerment um, event she had, she's like, if Juanita's not a part of it, I don't want any parts of it. Wow. And she may, and she's a, a woman of color. And it was crazy because I wrote a speech for her and I had heard that she hated every speech that was given to her in our bureau. And she read my speech and she came up to me because I remember my director at the time. He's like, why didn't come here? Come on, come on. You know, she's, she's calling you over here. And I was like, yes, you know, assistant secretary. She's like, no, call me by my first name. Okay. And she said, this is probably one, this is one of the best speeches I've ever read since I've been here. I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, well, it was a group effort because in, in the State Department, everything has to get cleared, meaning everything mm -hmm. has to be approved before you send it up. And I was very, very surprised. Um, and she and I have a, you know, have a good relationship, um, you know, even if we're from different, different, you know, points of view. But when it came to women's economic empowerment, I mean, she made sure that Anytime she talked about women's empowerment, she would say the work that the the program that they end up launching, the foundation was my work. And every mm. speech that she made publicly, she would shout me out or shout out the office that I had moved on to from there. So she respected me very much so um, when it came to doing that work. And that that let me know I was on the right track, um, even when you have someone who's from a different political view. Um, it made me feel good. And, you know, there is, we can see, you know, there's common ground on, on some things. That's awesome. Wow, that's awesome. Anyway, our co-partner, Chikechi says hello. Uh, where was that? Hello, Anita. That's Kechi. And then she says she's listening and learning. And then she laughed at your uh, madame. It's a, <laughs> it's a Ghanaian thing. <laughs> so yeah. she understands living Ghana. Dale, she understands. She understands. She understands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 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 tell us. So so how's life right now? What's um what's keeping you busy in Accra and West Lagos? Oh man, traffic. <laughs> traffic. <That is> like... <laughs> um, it's interesting because you know um, the COVID situation is is different. I mean, what. You know, what I will say, what I really like is that the administration has, you know, they're, everybody's doing the best they can. But we have a mask mandate, like no mask, no entry. They will chase you down with a, a temperature gun in a minute and they will sanitize the mess out of you. And they will say, you need to wash your hands or, you know, they'll look at you like, oh, you didn't wash your hands. Oh, you're not coming in here. Sorry. Um, so yeah. they're very much. Um, um, you know, very much of, of about that, which I'm glad to see. There's a bunch of, you know, hand-washing stations that I've seen. 
even social distancing to an extent, um, I mean, it's probably way better than the current situation that's going on in the U.S. Um, and even when I've heard people who are traveling into the country, I've heard pretty good things from, you know, I mean, it's expensive to get tested. You have to get tested before you come into the country. Yeah. I think you have to get tested when you come into the country. It's like 300 bucks or something like that. If you end up paying like $600 before you leave Ghana for COVID testing. Um, so that's an extra expense. Um, and the thing is, it's a rapid test. So I heard it goes, you know, it's like 15 minutes. You can get your results, 15 or 30 minutes, something to that effect. But um, a lady I know who came here from Switzerland, she said, you know, coming out of Europe, she's like, Ghana is probably the most organized country she's seen. So it's been, you know, really good. Um, and, you know, life is starting back here. I actually missed the president's last address as far as what is allowed. I mean, of course, funerals and weddings have resumed for a couple months now. But, um, you know, what I... I, I mean, I see more kids going back to school. Um, yeah, because they actually hide. They actually ate all the fried fish from the the lady I tried to get my fish from. So I had to wait. <laughs> so I was like, oh, they're back. <laughs> the kids are back. <laughs> yeah. um, and just trying to plan, uh, you know, life. And social, you know, being social here is very different because you have these pockets of like repats, expats, which consist of, you know, diplomats or people who just wanted to move to Ghana. Um, it could be a hard space to get in because, you know, a lot of the people here have known each other, like when I lived in Minnesota, they've known each other since they were children. And so it's kind of hard to break into that mold a little, you know, break into the group, you know, because then they'll also go between local language or they'll speak pidgin and then, you know, like like black Americans, we have our own slang. So, you know, if you're someone who says like John or something like that, they're like, I'm from, you know, Florida. I don't know what John is. Mm -hmm. Or John even is, saying yeah. John here. I have to be careful saying John in Ghana or even in West Africa because people will say, they think I'm saying John, which can sometimes mean a prostitute or a sex worker. And that's not what I mean <laughs> at all. <laughs> and I'm like, no, John It can be. <laughs> So, you know, I was like, John is a person, place, or thing. It's a noun. And they're like, John? Sex worker. <laughs> no, that's not so what I'm talking about at all. Just scratch that, reverse it. So, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, and then, too, as we start to see this influx of people who are coming in, kind of like when I moved to D.C., you have people who come and reinvent themselves. You know, like, oh, my name is Quesse Jenkins. You know your name was Jamal when you lived on 22nd Street. Come on. <laughs> So you see, <laughs> so you see a lot of that. Um, but I will say, you know, if you find your own kind of, you know, group of people, um, there's a, there's definitely folks from HBCUs here. There's the Divine Nine. If you're someone in a Greek organization, um, I come from both of that worlds, and you meet folks from all over. You know, there's a lot of people from Philly here, which I'm starting to realize more and more. Um, actually, I just went to a pizza place. Uh, Fred the other day in East Legon near ANC Mall, and the guy is from Baltimore. And wow. he got me in. And I mean, he's definitely from Baltimore. He was like, Yeah, I'm from Baltimore. And I was like, Oh, yeah, you're from Baltimore. And his homeboy was in town. He was like, Well, I live in Anacostia. And I was like, Oh, wow. And so it's just interesting. Like, you find, you know, I won't say sense of normalcy, but like, you know, you find your, 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 your tribe and you find what makes you feel like home. Um, yeah. So I'm still still learning um, about all things Ghana. You know, I don't have have a generator for my house, so the lights do go off, and you know all of that. You know, so it's it's definitely uh, interesting. I'm not in a point yet where I'm like, oh, I want to go back home. I, I just need to read the news. I'm like, nope, I'm good. I'm missing you, me, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're not missing yeah, anything. Hold down, hold down. <laughs> I miss Chick-fil-A. <laughs> you miss Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Till you find out where they send in their money. You know what I'm Find out what they fund. Uh, <laughs> so I, I want to talk to you a little bit more about the work you do. Uh, a lot of the stuff that you were dealing with is about women's empowerment. What are the biggest obstacles to women who are trying to be involved in agribusiness? Um hmm. There's several. Um, so each country, each continent has their own culture. 
And so what you see here in Ghana is that there are a lot of women who are, you know, there's market women, there's women who are working in the farms, there's all types of stuff. So you see a lot, I mean, Ghana, I think they were, you know, they were just reported that they have the largest, I think, largest number of women entrepreneurs um, I think in, in all of West Africa, if not in the continent, but I think West Africa or something like that. And so, um, you know, what the issue that you hear in any country is the scaling up situation. Um, how can I find funding in order to um, scale up my operation, which affects all entrepreneurs here on the continent, especially here in Ghana, you know, if I, most of the people do their work in their house and mm -hmm. there aren't any production facilities, there aren't any factories, you know, like you have in the U.S. where, you know, General Mills, they have distribution centers all over the country, you know, different parts of the country. You don't have that here in Ghana, right? And so that's kind of the work that I'm doing is, you know, building, creating that space. And I want to get into building a commercial, I'm in the process of building a commercial kitchen, um, which is a facility for oh, people uh, who want to scale up outside of their home and be able to do that here and also offer funding. So the other side of it is just capital, right? And, you know, when they do these calls for businesses, they'll say, we have $100 billion and it's going to be spread out within all of Africa. And you're like, wait, there's 54 countries. Well, $100 billion is great for one country. Mm -hmm. So when you yeah. think about it, one when you break it all down, you're like $100 billion divided by, well, we're not going to include everybody. So let's say 45 countries. You know, that's really not a lot. You know, no. I mean, you can use, you know, a couple million dollars just on infrastructure alone. And that's only tapping, you know, that's barely scratching the surface. Um, so it's always interesting. So, you know, the work that I do is helping um, women entrepreneurs more so on the research and develop product development side. You know, they'll say, oh, I have this product. You know, I want to do this, this and this or I want to improve my food safety. How can I do that? Um, because you have a lot of people who come here or people who are well, a lot of people who come here who were never in the food space to begin with and they don't want to learn about food safety and it's people like me that get sick and then I can kind of diagnose myself and be like, ah, I had salmonella poisoning from your mm. such and such. And it's like, now is the time to let's talk about proper food handling. Because even though it's hot here, that does not mean that, you know, you should not be concerned about your customers. And so, you know, that's really the work that I do. So it's a couple different things. So, um, you know, creating these spaces where we're talking about proper food safety for um, not just folks from the diaspora, but also, you know, some of the, you know, folks who've been, who've never left. And you, what you will find sometimes too, is that the women who sell food on the side of the road are a lot cleaner than the restaurants. <laughs> so, mm. you know, it's also oh, wow. an opportunity to also create that exchange too, right? It's like, you know, well, if the women from, you know, the market woman or the woman who has, who's in the kiosk, if she can do it, then if you're someone coming from the diaspora, why can't you do the same? You know, it's, it's, it, it should be an equal exchange and it's about, safety because people get sick all the time. And so um, that's really the work that I do and, and I consult. So currently I'm on the docket for even um, working in waste management and helping them create a, a framework. So that's mm -hmm. the other thing too, because you know a lot of people have ideas, they want to do stuff, but how can we actually nail it down to have a framework when we're doing lessons learned? And that comes from doing the uh, evaluation piece, like doing monitoring and evaluation of your entire framework and I've done I did that at the State Department as well so kind of putting all these things together you know I think um, what I like learning what I'm learning about myself is that we get so bogged down about how we should have a purpose and it has to be one thing when in actuality it could be multiple things you mm. know you I'm meant to do multiple things and have multiple uh, uh, ideas coming out not just focusing on one thing and doing this one thing for 20 years like I teach yoga but I don't, I mean, I'm, and I'm a yoga teacher. I actually don't even want to teach that much. I prefer to do workshops, which is a one-time off, you know, off thing, random thing. And I don't have to teach all the time because, you know, I can focus on 25 other things. So that's, you know, kind of what I, what I do here in Ghana, but also what I see as far as the challenges of being a woman and also too being a woman. Right. Um, patriarchy is very much prevalent all over the world. So, the, yeah. you know, the continent is not different. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. What I learned this week from a talk that I moderated was talking about the effects of colonialism on African cultures. So, you know, you have very much the gender roles. Oh, if, I, if I'm a man, I'm supposed to be the person to do this. If I'm a woman, you're supposed to be in the kitchen. 
But mm -hmm. from an African perspective, you know, what I was learning from this panel was that before colonialism, actually women were, were there women who were running countries or who were running, you know, tribes or women who were in charge of the military, you know, reminiscent of what we saw in Black Panther, you know, mm -hmm. and all of that was interrupted when colonialism, you know, and was introduced. And so, you know, that thing too is that, you know, kind of letting women also, what we've seen as a result of that is that in some countries, in African countries, women cannot take out a loan unless their mm -hmm. husband knows about it, mm -hmm. which can sometimes be a good thing because you had, you know, but it's actually most a, a bad thing. And some people say, well, why is that so bad? Well, if your husband's not good with money, and he's the one taking out the loan for you, you may never see that money. So that means that y'all won't be able to scale up because you found that your husband may have used it on things that we probably don't need to list in this show. So, <laughs> you know, and, and the thing about it is you guys are forever staying in this one, one economic status when you could, you know, see yourselves mm -hmm. progressing. Um, and so you see a lot of that too. And then also not being able to, maybe have a voice, right? So women may have may have this whole thing of being heard, but not, you know, not being spoken to. Um, you know, so it's very, very different things. I'm not here from an American context to be like, I'm here to liberate all the women. You know, we're gonna run this place like America. It's not like that at all, because that, that's usually the first thing. I, what's funny living here is you hear a lot of men when, you're, when you say, oh, I want to not have to worry about, you know, like, having to flirt with my boss to get a promotion. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I agree. Wait, does that make me a feminist? You're like, what? No, that makes you a human being. <laughs> 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 it's so extreme. It's so extreme. So it's, I was just like, that doesn't make you a feminist. And that, actually, you're thinking of it from probably the, you know, more of the uh, mainstream concept, not even thinking of what a, a woman is, which is what, what Alice Walker is, the person that actually mm -hmm. termed the, the, term the term womanist, which means it's encompassing of everybody. So, um, you know, for me, it's more so making sure the playing field is, is, is equal for women when it comes to scaling up a business and also understanding too, like what financial institutions are, are, can work with you and how, how to do that and how to write a grant. So that is really the work that I do here. Um, and then, you know, starting up this commercial kitchen. So, you know, you check it with me in about a year and a half and hopefully there won't be too many tears shed but i'll have hopefully i'll have some good news by that point so that's what i've been doing absolutely that is amazing yeah you're an amazing person well, thanks for all you do <laughs> and that's that's going to create a lot of em employment and you know touch a lot right. of families and all that so so tell me um tell me about the transition or if uh someone were to like a brother or sister here where to want to make to repat or you know pack up and leave because of the conditions Tuesday. around because of <laughs> next Tuesday. <laughs> Let's just be real. If Tuesday yeah, doesn't work out in our favor, <laughs> <laughs> what are some top three no. things in, you need before you pack up and leave, or maybe top five, top ten? Or what, and what should you consider? No. Yeah. Well, first off, please visit before you come. Don't be one of these people that just rolls over to Ghana and then you're like, I hate it here. I'm like, will you do <laughs> <laughs> um, Also understand that it's very different. Um, <laughs> so understand that, you know, you are an American. They get screwed and, you know, it comes, you're a foreigner. Um, and th there's that. <laughs> Um, understanding that, so I would say come and visit first, um, and understand that, you know, if you have money, <clears throat> you need to really see how long it stretches. So there's a lot of expat restaurants here. You eat there every day. You won't have any money by the time you're done. Right here. <laughs> um, also understand, seriously, also understand that you have to pay for rent a year in or two in advance. Um, even if you are Ghanaian descent, from what I've heard, you know, you will, you may still have a tough transition. Um, mm -hmm. If you are a person with locks, it, you know, I heard it's easier, you know, you see more people with locks more so now than I've heard several years ago. Um, and then just price, how, price out what you want to ship. 
Um, the, the one benefit about being a guy is you can kind of be off the, mar- off the map. Like, you know, I know my address. I don't have a mailbox. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's always interesting. My mom is like, I want to mail you something. I'm like, not unless you want to pay DHL. And she's like, mm, yeah, no. Um, mm-hmm. So I would definitely say do your research. Talk to people who've lived there. Understand that just because you have a business idea, give yourself a year to adjust um, so that you understand the culture. Um, I would also say from the dating situation, please don't come here thinking, oh, I'm, I mean, you know, some people do. I mean, you know, come here like I'm going to have a Ghanaian husband and da 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 or a Ghanaian wife and blah, blah, blah. There's a dating culture here as well. And, you know, just come in and just learn and understand that, you know, your first year should just be just taking it all in. Um, also understand that, you know, credit cards and paying with debit cards, it's not always a thing. Um, sometimes they don't work. We don't have always the luxury of being, you know, what you deal with in the West. Um, and then just be open-minded. You know, you have to be open-minded. Um, also prepare your taste palette. <clears throat> you, a lot of things are spicy. I would definitely say that my spice has, my spice level has probably increased 20-fold <laughs> as compared to when I was in the U.S. So one of my friends, so I, I went out to the pizza place, and the guy was like, oh, she's American. She probably won't eat this. And I was like, oh, no, this is good. They were like, wait, what? Like, this is spicy stuff. I was like, you just have to breathe slow in between bites. Like, that's all. Just keep eating. They're like, what? Okay. Um, and then I would also say, too, um, be realistic. I mean, and understand that, you know, there's each country has its own challenge. Um, yeah. you know, I have a friend, I have friends who are like, why don't all the black Americans move to, move to Ghana? I'm like, Ghana doesn't always have paved roads. The lights go mm-hmm. out. The water can be a little sketch from time to time. Mm-hmm. I know some of my friends won't be moving to Ghana, <laughs> you know, just based off of those three things. Mm-hmm. They're not going to do it. And you can't expect that from people as well. And then also understand that colonialism and slavery has done damage on everybody. Um, It's not just Americans because you realize soon enough that even people on the continent, they kind of see us as a monolith. Some people do to an extent. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's a wide range of of people who are from here. So don't assume because the guy Mian or the other African who's never left the country, never left their country, is not as knowledgeable, if not more knowledgeable about you. Because what happens in America, people pay attention. Um, they pay attention to what goes on. And also, there are a lot of more, you know, I think we always assume, oh, they're so Neanderthal and they're thinking. No, everybody's progressive in their own way. We're all liberal on some things. We're all a little conservative on some things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, really kind of extending grace. And last but not least, have patience. Um, I would definitely say my first month here, it was challenging because, you know, you're trying to understand the culture and it's not like, you know, as a diplomat, you get shielded from that to an extent because mm-hmm. you have someone that takes care of your housing. You have someone that does this, does that. Here, I had to find my own apartment, understanding that a guy had to introduce me. And then when I paid my money, they realized, ta-da, it's actually a woman that's going to live here. Um, so, you know, understanding that part, actually understanding how to get an apartment, understanding what the difference between paying in Ghana cities and paying in USD is very different. Even negotiating your contract, you know, you want to get paid this versus this. So there's you, just be patient. Um, but my first month here, I mean, I had cussed somebody out. She, she had it coming, though. But I had to cuss somebody <laughs> out. Um, and... I, my patience, I'm like, it's too hot to be this mad. And you will also go through an emotional, uh, I won't say a reckoning, but just an emotional moment because you're removing these layers of what we've had to deal with living in the West or anywhere. And it's different because now you're kind of building on a different shield of not mm-hmm. trying to take things personally because people will say things to you that don't make sense. And you're like, what? Like, you know, someone, when my hair was longer, I used to have, I had it braided at the top and I had my hair shaved on the side and somebody assumed I was, uh, I was lesbian. And I'm like, I'm not, you know, and even if I was, it's none of your business, but based off of my hair, this is the assumption that you made. And so, you know, um, you just have to be patient and understand that there's ignorance everywhere in the world, but also understanding since I've lived here, I've learned so much more about African history, you know, learning more about Patrice Lumumba, learning more about Thomas Sankara, 
you know, outside of just the Nelson Mandela, you know, and even his story is mainstreamed a little bit, you know, so I would just say come in, come with open arms, but please, please, please come visit first. Mm -hmm. Don't just move. (laughs) Don't just move. Um, And make sure with the person you stay with, you might want to check out their house too, just to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's very good advice, and um, it's um, excuse me, it's 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 something that to consider all these things because that's that's when when I talk to the people who are real and the people who um, who are actually Ghanaians who lived here for lived abroad for a long time and transitioned back or. African Americans who lived here all their life and, tra- and transition to the continent. These are the the things that they lay out. Have a budget, mm-hmm. and I mean, some will actually say have a six months savings to, to live on before you mm-hmm. you make the transition. And know that it's a different place. But then once you get there and breathe the air, you know, <laughs> you know that you're is home. There any- <laughs> Well, even find an apartment, like you have to give yourself some time to be able to find an apartment. I, for some people I know it took them six months. Some people didn't find a part, an apartment that they liked for like a year. Um, mm-hmm. I happened to find mine the second month that I was here. And even now I'm considering, you know, moving. I mean, that happens a lot, you know, until you decide to buy a house. And then also this whole, you know, I'll just buy land and you'll be good to go. Buying land is actually a lot harder than people actually want to be quite honest about. Um, even if you yeah. are a person from, you know, even I've heard from other Ghanaians, they're like, it's it's hard to get land here. And I'm like, wait, you're from here. They're like, yeah, it's kind of tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you might want to consider buying outside Accra, especially. Yeah, if you want to do yeah. that and buy, yeah. and buy from a, from a, I mean, I have a few uh, contacts, buy from a, a reputed organization, not just anyone. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's that too. <laughs> you can't buy from it. Not all, all folks are not equal. They'll say you, you know, oh, you have this land and you didn't bring the right schnapps to the to the to the chief. You may not have any land. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I did. Uh, speaking of shipping stuff, I did ship some stuff to my brother last week. So it's it's pretty. I mean, you just have to go pick it up from downtown across central so it is yeah you can do it that way so i and i shipped shipped us yes oh you shipped the bear okay yeah i shipped us you don't have to use dhl oh Oh. okay because i was like can they be trusted now with all that's going on i was gonna wait till like december for people to start sending letters you know, because uh, and then or you know, just find somebody who's coming to the U.S. That's what I did. I had a, 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 a sorority sister come from the U.S. to come to Ghana, and I was like, "Listen, I got this Amazon order," and she's like, "Wait, you ordered a an electronic toothbrush? Hey, hey, man, don't no judge, no judging. <laughs> it's a little thing. It's a little thing. Bring me. I even had somebody bring me vanilla extract from Trader Joe's. Like it's serious. There's some things from Trader Joe's I just can't let go." Oh, really? Because <laughs> that's expensive. Like, spices are, that's the one thing I would definitely tell people. Spices are expensive here. So people have to keep that in mind. Unless you have your own garden and, you know, you grow everything. You can grow everything. That is if you have the space. And... Fred, Fred, yeah, I have all that, Fred. So, you know, just... <laughs> I live in an apartment, Fred. I mean, my mom's no. right there. We're hanging on. I'm trying, you know, I was trying to, I was thinking about going to get some herbs and stuff, but I, we'll see. I'm a plant lady, but we'll, we'll see. I would love to have a mango tree outside of my yard, but it's in my neighbor's yard. And I don't think they would be okay with me. That's a great thing. I growing up, we had a, growing up, we had a, we had all, all kinds of things, things in the backyard and Kate, you testified to this. Like we had a, Coconut, we had mangoes, we had bananas and cinnamon, chamomile, everything in the backyard. But I mean, and then so we'll go, we need some, we want some food, we just go and pluck it from the backyard. Right. So, but then, right. but then that takes, I mean, that's gonna cost you a fortune now to have that kind of luxury <laughs> to have all that. Right. Land. Well, and I have a friend who, so I have a friend who lives, she's Ghanaian American, she lives around the corner from me, and she, um, 
started doing her own garden. So I've been reaping the benef the benefits from that. So I said, you know, when I do buy, um, you know, property here, that is, so I, I would even do it in the U.S. But I said that, you know, I will, my plan is to, you know, have a garden in my house. Like I want to have a mango tree. Um, I love smelling jasmine when I go for a walk in my neighborhood. Um, so, you know, those are different luxuries. And then just seeing the coconut man walk by, you know, you're like, you call him over. Hey, I just want, you know, two coconuts. And, you know, he chops it off for you because I don't have a machete in my house. That's why I don't buy. I don't pick coconuts from people. So, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> so, you did yourself. so, you know, yeah, no, yeah, no, I can't be trusted. So that's why I'm like, I'll just have somebody do that for me. But, <laughs> but it's nice to be able to eat, like, even markets. I mean, there's. You know, Fred, you know Hacho. So the Hacho market Hacho, yeah. is walking distance. Yeah, it's literally, Hacho is literally right around the corner. So I walk there with, as part of my, my routine. It's a two, it's four miles, you know, back. So two down, two back. And so we walk at night, well, like, you know, early evening, me and my friend uh, Katie, and um, we walk and I get my pineapple from this lady. I get my my melons i get my tilapia this person who grows tilapia so i do all wow. these things you know um at the market and you know i'm like i it's good because that means i'll have to go to Makola at the time and jesse Makola is like the, the market of all it's like the gauntlet <laughs> everybody you gotta go to Makola before you leave ghana and i'm like well, you can just go early because when it gets crowded whoo it's a lot i my, it's what, like i mean even though our you know, our COVID numbers are low. I always say um, there's too many Negroes, not enough math. So I don't <laughs> want to go to <laughs> So I'm like, no, I'll just, I'll just pass. <laughs> so I go to the little markets around the corner, you know, and, and get stuff, you know, and get my fruits or whatever and call it a day. So I do do that. Okay, cool, cool. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> this has been very, very interesting and eye-opening. I want to ask the question that I'm sure everybody in Black America is, is wanting to know. Um, do you feel racially profiled by police while, you, <laughs> while you're going to the market, or do you feel like there's a legitimate threat that police may kill you on the way home from the market where you are now? No. Um, the police situation here is a little different. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, have, I mean, there's checkpoints at night. There's checkpoints at night. You just have to worry about, you know, giving them something small, right? <laughs> Dash them for something. <laughs> Which, you know, give them a little bit of money. I mean, if you're a diplomat with red tags, you don't really have to worry about that life. But, I mean, okay. the rest of us, um, I, I've never heard, I mean, I haven't heard about, you know, brutality here as opposed to like in Nigeria, but that doesn't mean it can't happen. Um, so I would definitely tell people that like it can happen, you know, brutality can happen anywhere, even in your, you know, when people who look like you. Um, you know, I didn't really hear there was any craziness going on. The only time I heard like it was a little crazy was during the lockdown because people were going places they weren't supposed to. And then you have like the police kind of pull you over and be like, oh, you don't want to listen. Now you need to sweep up you know, Ring Road, which is like this huge intersection. It's like Capitol Boulevard in Raleigh. And there'll be this broomstick that's like made out of like, you know, like I heard crazy stuff like that, but I don't even know if that's true. But, okay. um, you know, I, I've never heard any issues as far as like, you know, being, um, you know, having any type of brutality. As far as being discriminated against, I mean, the only thing is, is like, oh, they see I'm a woman, they may try to, you know, you know, guys, with, you know, people are people. So they may try mm -hmm. to say something to you like, oh, hey, hey, pretty lady, you know, that kind of thing. And then that's the extent of my experience. But mm -hmm. I have not heard, even from my friends who lived here, um, who have said like, oh, I've been, you know, you know, you know, you know been harassed. They may be harassed in some different type of way. Mm -hmm. But not in a way where it's like, my life is in danger. I've never, okay. I've never heard that. So it's, it's different. Um, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's probably more of an offline conversation. Okay. But it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting because, you know, you hear about, we always hear police brutality in the form of, you know, the U S but when you hear about something that's going on in Nigeria and you hear this has been going on since, you know, the seventies or what 
forever how long it's been happening. You know, it's, it, it can happen in any country. And so that is something I also have to keep in mind as well is that, you know, every country has something. Um, thankfully, here it's not police brutality. Okay. Fair answer. Fair point. I think that's what we want to know. We, we apparently have a racist that has joined our conversation uh, from Russia. So, <laughs> so if, if we can do something to close that out, I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but any, anyways, I, 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 oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, Kitchy, uh, uh, can you get rid of the, the guy? Kitchy should get a chance to go on a platform and block him. Yeah. There's no hate here. <laughs> and and white life is not better. Just just <laughs> like you know, <laughs> your life sucks. So, just putting it out there. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry about that, Juanita. I'm trying. I'm getting better. You know, like, I'm, getting, like, <laughs> I'm getting better. In Russia, well, I know the story wasn't. It turned out not to be true, but this may say Putin released like a lot. I'm in the streets, so people wouldn't leave their house during COVID. I'm kind of just like that. <laughs> I don't know what's I don't know what's what's going on, but we're not even gonna give any credence to that. No, so no, no. uh the, the biggest thing right now, just to give you an, an update, I know you probably know better than we do, but to give you an update, uh, for those who haven't already done so, we are in voting season for places that have early voting. This is the last day. Come Tuesday, it's game on. So if you have not voted yet, make sure that you are uh, prepared to go vote. Um, I, I won't use my platform to tell you how to vote. I think you can look at the news articles and kind of figure it out pretty quickly. <laughs> um, but definitely exercise your right. It's important. Um, the I one mean, thing I, I will... I, oh, go ahead. I don't know because... I don't know. I've had people say the opposite. It's crazy. Have people say, what, voting's not important? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I hear yeah. you. No, so I, you know, it's interesting. I have friends who are like, oh, I'm not going to vote. I'm like, my vote doesn't count. I'm like, how the, we're done, you know, they're now just releasing, you know, information about how Bush, you know, the, the election was rigged during the Bush time. And, mm -hmm. you know, and now it's all coming together as far as, you know, why the Supreme Court pick was so vital because she was one of the people that pushed through, you know, Bush winning. And so, you know, the thing is, it's never been a, a fair playing field, but why would you even want to play into that, um, that narrative? Mm -hmm. So it, to me, it, it is very obvious, like, why would you even think about, Bush? but, you know, at the same time, too, even hearing about, you know, um, you know, folks who are coming into the U.S. who weren't, you know, born and raised in the U.S. And they're like, oh, well, I'm making a lot of money under Trump. I'm like, but your time will end, too, because eventually they mm -hmm. will find out what color you are. And they're going to be mm -hmm. coming for all of your money. So, <laughs> you know? so no one is safe. Um, not uh oh Maybe we lost you a little bit, Juanita. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to, you know, once again, reiterate, vote. And it's not even just about the, the national politics. Like voting also deals with your state and local government. So for everybody who was out there protesting during the a pandemic, make sure that you don't just sit at home and say, okay, well, I'm not going to exercise my right to say anything about it. You vote for mayors, you vote for judges, you vote for city councilmen, you vote for county commissioners. So make sure that you do your research, go out here and vote for people who are going to promote the interests that you care about. And, you know, and also, you know, anybody who's voted can tell you it's going to be a line of folks telling you what you want to hear when you get yeah. to the polling site. And that doesn't necessarily always go with what the track record is that those people have been doing. So don't just wait and go to the voting site and, and vote for the person that's nice to you. OK, make sure that you have done a little bit of research. If you go to your county board of elections, they'll give you kind of a voter guide and you can look at the names and Google search and see what people have been doing. So don't let this great gift of Google on Rihanna's Internet go away and you not know what's going on when you go up in there and uh, and, and place your vote. Uh, also, if you are in the South, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, if you are in the South and you have not already voted, 
be prepared because uh, there's going to be some people out there who are going to be trying to discourage you uh, forcefully uh, from voting. And I'm not telling you to run from them. I'm not even telling you to, to uh, really entertain them. But what I will say is you also have a, a right to defend yourself. You have a right to protect yourself. And I would encourage you to exercise that right to protect and defend yourself and go in and vote. Make sure you report it, even though, you know, we've also got reports here in North Carolina where people are reporting to law enforcement. But law enforcement is part of the group. That's white supremacists and it's not working. So whatever the case may be, we want you to get home safely, but we want you to vote. Right. Voting can change all this stuff. So make sure if you haven't done so already, get out there. Um, I hate waiting to the last minute. So I voted, you know, what, a week and some change ago. Um, just so I could avoid those kinds of problems. But if you haven't done so and you can't make it today, please, 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 please go out there on Tuesday and vote. Um, I will be doing, you know, everybody knows on Facebook, I do my little election commentary whenever there's a debate. I plan on doing the same thing the evening of the countdown because whether good, bad, and different, however it goes down, it's going to be funny. So, so <laughs> might as well laugh about it. Um, as long as you've done your part. Now, if you didn't vote, don't laugh. You don't have a right to say anything. Yet. But, <laughs> but yeah, so definitely good. check that out. Uh, Juanita, can you give them uh, your information? So for the people, let me put a disclaimer out. For people who want to contact you more about the work that you do, and keep in mind, this is not this is not for you to go and, and pitch to Juanita or spit game to Juanita through <laughs> commercial. Like, hey, this is not for that, right? This, well, in that case, self-assess, right? <laughs> self-assess. And she will talk about you if that picture's ugly. Okay. So self-assess. Um, but Juanita, if you would give people your social media handle so they can get in contact with you. Sure. Um, you can find me on Instagram. Um, it is in as in depending uh, on people You can type, type it into the one. Oh, I can type it in the chat. Okay, perfect. Yeah, the private chat. Yeah, put it in the private chat. We can I'll share it. it. I'll share it. Okay, there's someone who said they're okay, late to the party. Who, who, who is must be one of our people, one of our, a family member. Can you tell us who you are? I just see Facebook user. I'm late to the party. And then uh, KG says, go vote. And then please vote, vote, vote. <laughs> and yeah, just see Facebook user. Usually when they log in from um, Afriscope TV, uh, we just see Facebook user. You don't, we don't see who it is. Ah, okay. So probably that's what's happening. Okay. All right. Um, Juanita is back. Oh, we got Juanita. Yeah, OK, she's back. Okay. Okay, I'm back. So I had an old people moment. I put the wrong. <laughs> so let me so let me put my. They're like, what? Let me let me add this in. I'm trying to put my ID on my phone. Okay. And yes, and, and while she's doing so that, for you can anybody find who... me on. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, you can find me on Instagram. I'll also put my Twitter handle up here as well. What I'll say is while we're doing that, um, also, for those of you who may not have already done so, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We put we upload these videos pretty regularly. Uh, we also would say uh, if you have not done so already, follow us and like our page on Facebook. Um, we, we share a lot of content on there. We want to make sure you're informed. Also, T-shirts, these cool things are available. So you can get all the links for everything on our Facebook page. We'll continue to promote. Also, if you know people, because I've, I've been getting messages now from people all over the world, black people in places that I didn't even know black people were at. So if you know black people in a part of the world that we haven't already covered, uh, Jamaica, I'm looking at you. Uh, if you know black people anywhere in the part of the world we haven't covered, please, please, please feel free to drop us a message. We do not bite. As long as the message is not racist, we will not bite. Uh, we, we will uh, look into it and see what we might be able to do to arrange it. Uh, we appreciate all of you for taking the time out on a Saturday 
to get to uh, know us, to follow us, and to laugh along with us as we explore the greatness of our culture, uh, no matter where we may originate. So no matter where we're from, the greatness of our culture, the greatness of Africa in general, uh, and we thank you for joining us. I want to turn it over to Fred to close us out. Oh, Fred, they got you muted. Sorry, I, was, I, I muted myself. Sorry. So I shared Juanita's info. Her IG is Nita Bita underscore PhD. Okay, let me share that again. Nita Bita underscore PhD. That's it for you folks on Periscope. And then um, her Twitter is Juanita L, right? Juanita L. Oh, I think you're muted. Unmute. Okay, I'm mute. I unmuted you. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's her. And then her, her, you, her, her, her This is a business. She also has a business. It's a business, right? <laughs> yoga mask removal. Yeah, it's my yoga pants. You know, that's what we do as black people. We put our chicken and ribs page up there too. Church page. <laughs> <laughs> cool so that's all that's that's it for me so if you want to get in touch with her please shoot her a message on instagram and twitter okay so thank you miss Juanita, for coming we could go on for a long time but we have the time limit we're definitely having you back and we'd like to know what's going on with the commercial kitchen we'll definitely get in touch with you and uh, thanks everyone sure. for joining us Thanks for joining us this uh, Saturday morning for me. Still, still morning here in California. Uh, afternoon in where uh, Jesse is. And almost nighttime in Accra, Ghana. All right, yeah, it's almost uh, almost 6 o'clock in Accra. All right. All right, bye, everyone. Yes, time. <laughs> that was, Thank oh, you. I need to hang on. 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 Hang on.